creating a republic of fear in Egypt, from cracking down on journalists, protesters and even his own supporters. The Egyptian president is accused of failing to improve human rights. Three years after the coup that brought Abdel Fattah el-Sisi to power, where is Egypt heading? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. Over the past five years, Egypt has seen revolution and counter-revolution. A brief spell of civilian rule, then a return to military rule. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi led the military coup in 2013. Since then, rights groups say the liberties of Egyptians have been eroded in every way possible. Thousands of civilians have been tried in military courts. Many more are in prison. The government has effectively banned protests and hundreds have been sentenced to death following trials which are criticised as unfair. Well, the latest organisation to sound the alarm is Egypt's own official rights watchdog, the National Council for Human Rights. Its latest report describes widespread abuse in prisons where torture and overcrowding have become commonplace forcing prisoners to take turns sleeping because of a lack of space. The rights report says pre-trial detention is being used as punishment in itself and that pre-trial jails are particularly overcrowded, holding 300% more prisoners than they should. It also talks about high levels of forced disappearances, which are often blamed on the Interior Ministry's security forces. Let's now begin our discussion. In Berlin, we have Ahmed Badawi, senior researcher for the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Politics at the Free University of Berlin. In Washington, D.C., Timothy Caldas, non-resident fellow at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. And in Melbourne, via Skype, Mohamed Kairat, founder and editor-in-chief of news media organization Egyptian streets. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here on Inside Story. Ahmed, start with you. Are you surprised by this report, by the extent of its criticisms? Um, I have to say yes. I was uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, the report is quite critical. Of course, it could have gone further. Uh, it documents uh, widespread cases of uh, abuse, of uh, abuse of freedoms, of uh, uh, due process. Uh, for a long time, me and others, uh, we've been quite cynical about the National Council for Human Rights. Uh, we thought it's, uh, it's only going to be uh, uh, window dressing and uh, that it doesn't have real bite. Uh, maybe it doesn't have real bite. Uh, I don't think that the government will change its policies uh, because of this report. But uh, to respond to your question, I think uh, the report is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, whether uh, any of the recommendations in the report uh, would be taken up by the government or not, it's something to be seen. Um, but on the whole, I think uh, it's, it's a good report, it's uh, quite balanced. Of course, uh, it could have gone further in mm. documenting, for example, uh, for example the, the cases of forced disappearances that are uh, mentioned in the report. I would say it's probably quite less than the actual cases of forced disappearances in the country. Uh, but I am I'm pleasantly surprised with this report, actually. Oh, Mohamed, would you agree with that, that you're uh, pleasantly surprised by what you're seeing in this report, which is issued by a government body? Um, I'd first like to say that it's a positive step for a government body to recognize that this is happening across Egypt's prisons and that, you know, forced disappearances are happening. However, I'm not at all surprised by the report because similar ones by the same council have been released in the past. And frankly, not much reaction has come to those reports. Timothy, what message do you see this report sending? And do you, are you at all optimistic that anything will act on it? I mean, it confirms what we've already uh, been able to see uh, throughout the past three years. Um, and uh, of course, it's great to have it come from a government body because then it's more difficult for government officials to evade uh, accepting that this is going on. Um, I agree with Mohammed that I, uh, I have 
limited optimism about this affecting actual uh, actual practices in the prisons and uh, in terms of freedom of speech. But um, at the same time, I did read one report that suggested at least some young people might be pardoned uh, in response to the recommendations that came out. Uh, with respect to the forced disappearances, I agree that a lot more could be said. Um, it does appear that there might have been some tension between different members about how serious they took that uh, particular issue with uh, Mohammed Fay claiming that uh, the uh, that the numbers were being exaggerated in the foreign press um, and Mohsen Awad uh, emphasizing the significance of this issue. Mohammed, who do people fear in Egypt? I think the people fear, uh, I mean, in my opinion, an, a completely ineffectual parliament, a parliament that no longer really represents them or stands for their rights when you know, we've had a parliament now for four or five months that hasn't necessarily discussed issues such as human rights because it has been involved in other discussions such as, you know, procedural issues. That is the biggest fear for many people in Egypt that in the long run, nothing changes. Ahmed, what, what would you respond to that? Would you say that parliament and uh, it being a toothless body that essentially just supports Sisi, is that the biggest obstacle standing the way, in the way of Egypt's progression? Mm, biggest obstacle, I don't know. Uh, are, the, the problems in Egypt are so deep, they're structural. Uh, a lot of the problems have to do with, the, with, the, with political culture in Egypt, with the entrenched uh, uh, attitude of acting with impunity by the state. Uh, there are also lots of problems, uh, lots of societal problems. Uh, the, the regime that is ruling Egypt now did not come from outer space, did not come from Mars. It is a product of a society that has been depoliticized, that has been ruled uh, by fear, and by propaganda for the last, not only 30 years, but actually for the last 60 years. Uh, the problems are deep. I would say the biggest obstacle now, uh, in, my, in my point of view, is the incapacity of a real opposition to take shape. Uh, in the opposition, they are also suffering from the same problems that are plaguing the regime and also the Muslim Brothers. Uh, you can also find the same authoritarian attitude, uh, the same reliance on um, hearsay. Uh, there is no real uh, evidence-based uh, attempt at policy making. So the problems are really deep, and, and my argument is that this regime is a product of a society that has been failing and it is, uh, it is ruling over a state, and the state itself has been failing for so many years, and uh, to come out of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, these, of the myriad of problems that we have now is going to take a lot of effort, um, and I don't see this effort happening now in any organized, strategic, uh, vision-led way. Uh, Timothy, do you think the opposition has been broken in Egypt? Um, I think that the opposition is uh, highly disorganized and uh, a lot of people have become uh, dispirited and uh, frustrated from the past few years and seeing either friends and colleagues uh, imprisoned, uh, the repression of protest, and also the last couple of elections being kind of overwhelmed by either the security apparatus picks or their supporters. Um, there's a lack of confidence in their ability to affect change and that kind of undermines momentum of their supporters and their activists in terms of participating to build a movement or an organization that could uh, offer some substantial uh, challenge to the current government. Mm. I mean, do you agree that, that Sisi is almost running the show single-handedly? I mean, is there anyone else making oh, the decisions? Not. No. No, that, that's, I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a myth that exists uh, among people who don't really understand what's going on. Uh, the reality is that Sisi is one of many actors that are... Uh, competing to control the situation. Uh, in reality, the, the government is broken into a number of institutions that compete for power mm. and defining power uh, in their favor. So you have the judiciary, you have the uh, interior ministry, you have the military, um, connected of course with CC, and then you also have the intelligence apparatus. And these organizations, while they do share a number of interests and will act uh, in concert when, it, when they have uh, mutual interest, also at times will uh, will behave in ways that uh, are opposing to one another or uh, might undermine one another's objectives. Um, you saw it with the island decision in the judiciary annulling the agreement with Saudi Arabia. This was a major, uh, this was a major uh, objective of Sisi was to deliver these islands with as little 
uh, controversy or hiccups as possible, and the administrative court uh, completely canceled uh, the agreement. And it's, I mean, now it's under appeal. But the point is that these institutions look like they're all in concert under CC sometimes, but if you look more closely, you'll find that at times they're uh, they're operating um, at opposite. Uh, uh, with opposite agendas. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, isn't it? I mean, Mohammed, because we look at the courts and we see sort of what are seen to be bogus trials against Muslim Brotherhood members, against journalists, against any political opponents, and we see or we think that they are working together with Sisi. But do you agree that the courts are largely acting for their own interests independent of the political system? I think the courts, well, yes, definitely there is its own, to some extent, agenda, as Timothy stated. It's also a reflection of outdated laws and laws that have not been updated over the past several years because of a lack of any parliamentary system at all. There's been such a disorganization and chaos at Parliament to the extent that no new laws are being passed. Yes, we've had recommendations to alter or abolish things such as the protest law or the uh, press freedom law. However, none of this has actually gone forward, and thus the courts, in my opinion, are stuck having to um, apply older laws and laws that are no longer compatible with human rights or democracy mm. since the revolution. Uh, Timothy? Um, I, I would say that, uh, that problematic laws are only part of the problem. We have a number of court decisions that uh, seem to have very little concern about the legality of the outcome of the verdict. Uh, certainly, a lot of a lot of uh, verdicts come out with very little, if any, scrutiny of the evidence being presented by the prosecutor. Um, so there is also an issue of the the courts uh, pursuing verdicts when they see it as uh, desirable for other reasons. It's not strictly a legal problem. Ahmed, what's your view on this? What is the motive behind uh, many of the court's decisions? Um, I, I agree with what has been said so far. Uh, there is no powerful central authority in Egypt anymore. Of course, mm. Sisi is very much in the forefront, and it gives the impression, we get the impression that he's in control. I don't think that he is that much in control. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, the system, after the collapse of the Mubarak regime, has uh, fallen back on its, uh, on its main constituent elements. So different uh, factions, different tribes, even if you want to call them that, in the state are all fighting to preserve uh, the, uh, the, the their authority over their particular uh, jurisdictions. And, and the same thing with the judiciary. Um, I think that uh, there, is a, there is a nationalist favor uh, that many judges uh, feel, and I think this is a big motivation behind some of the verdicts that they issue, especially in the case of the Muslim Brothers. Uh, but apart from that, I think every judge is, uh, is acting more or less independently. Or maybe there are groups of judges that are affiliated to each other that maybe have uh, similar subcultures and diff similar uh, perspectives on, on different issues. But I very much agree that the, the, the central authority is actually much weaker than, than what we think in Egypt okay. now. Why, what would explain then all of these uh, court cases against journalists? And when you watch the trials, when you see the evidence that presents, that's presented, I mean, you look at it and they're making a mockery of the judicial system, the international judicial system. What, why would judge it be in the interest of judges to put journalists away? Uh, I think uh, we shouldn't also forget that um, uh, a large part of the judiciary or the judiciary as a whole is actually very much influenced by the security apparatus. So, of course, legally and uh, constitutionally, uh, the judiciary is independent. It has more power over all the other organs of the state. But mm. in practice, the security apparatus is extremely powerful. And I'm uh, almost certain that a lot of these cases, especially against the journalists or any other uh, opposition uh, figure or group, uh, not only the Muslim Brothers, a lot of these cases uh, are moved by the security apparatus. And I think the security apparatus uh, has a lot of influence influence and is putting a lot of pressure on the judiciary in order to take these cases to court. And uh, sometimes the security apparatus does not even comply with some of the decisions uh, of the courts, for example, by releasing some people. Or, uh, so I think a uh, big part of the problem uh, is, of course, the inefficiency of the judiciary, but also the, uh, the unbalanced influence 
and the exaggerated influence of the security apparatus on almost all aspects of society and on, and on other organs of the state. Okay. Uh, Mohammed, you're a journalist. To, to what extent do you see uh, the press syndicate, a rather influential um, journalism um, body in Egypt, to what extent do you see them fighting back against the system and against an increased crackdown on freedoms of the press? In the recent months, they certainly have been fighting back, and there's been protests, as you know, and mm. even on, at the moment, there's an ongoing court case against uh, several members of the press syndicate. However, it is quite unusual that this has suddenly appeared only in the past few months and not in the past few years, where there have been systematic press violations. However, this might uh, signal a shift in attitudes towards, you know, certain government actions towards press freedom um, following the January 25 revolution. It was as if press freedom had been given a whole new green light and all these new television channels popped up and all these new television show hosts and journalists came uh, expressing quite clear opinions, whether it was on websites or on television. But in the past few uh, months or past few uh, two years, it seems that press freedom has taken a back seat, mm. possibly because of security concerns. What's it like having a blog? You've got this blog, Egyptian Streets. Is it watched closely? Um, I think the biggest issue we tend to face is more uh, watching by the people themselves. We have a big issue in Egypt of self-censorship. Mm. Um, we personally haven't faced any issues from security ar apparatus harassing us, but from people themselves sending us messages or emails or whatever, harassing us and telling us to stop writing about certain things or telling us that we're, you know, betraying the country or acting against the country's interests. And this shows that in Egypt there is a need for an overall cultural shift and more education as to, you know, what is democracy, what are uh, the principles of human rights and various other educational um, issues that are at the core of many of Egypt's problems. Uh, Timothy Mohammed mentioned just there a, a justification for the crackdown on freedoms, often in the name of security. How far a point do you think that is? Well, I think it's the it's the government's excuse for its crackdown rather than an actual mm. like thought out justification. Um, and actually, the the National Council of Human Rights report mentioned that there are other countries that have been able to pursue. Uh, crackdowns on terrorism without violating human rights in the way that we've seen in Egypt. So they've, they've specifically addressed that, that argument made by the government and challenged it. Um, but certainly that's a, that's a narrative that is not limited to Egypt. Uh, even during uh, the beginning of the war on terrorism in the United States in 2001, we heard this idea that we had to balance our freedom with security and we had to start to uh, roll back some uh, privacy rights of citizens, uh, due process rights. Um, we saw that with, uh, with the Patriot Act. Uh, this, this discourse that uh, you can't fight terrorism while f maintaining a fully transparent uh, democracy that respects due process is um, unfortunately an argument that has gotten currency in a number of societies. Mm. Uh, Ahmed, do you, think it, uh, do you think it's a fair argument that uh, you can't have security without some crackdown on freedoms? Of course not. I don't think it's a fair argument at all. I think one of the best ways uh, to ensure stability and to maintain security is to provide freedoms. Uh, freedom is the way that would uh, secure society itself against any subversive attempt, whether by terrorists or by uh, corrupt elite. Uh, so I totally don't agree with this argument. Uh, there needs to be, uh, or there doesn't have to be any contradiction. Uh, between providing security, maintaining stability, and at the same time providing for freedoms. And here it's very important to emphasize when we talk about freedoms, I don't necessarily only mean uh, political freedoms, civil freedoms, but also, and perhaps even more importantly in the case of uh, Egypt, economic and social freedoms, uh, protecting economic and social rights. Uh, and this is an argument that I think a lot of human rights defenders are beginning to accept. Uh, it's, uh, the, the economic and social rights and fighting to protect them and to provide them is something that touches people more closely. And I totally agree that we have a problem in, in creating a culture of freedom, a culture of respect for human rights. 
on the level of society as a whole, and I think focusing on uh, providing and protecting uh, economic and social rights uh, may strike a chord uh, with the people and may sensitize people to these issues more than just the focus on, on political rights. It's not that political rights are mm. not important, but what I'm saying is they have been overly more emphasized on the expense of uh, social and economic rights. Just give us an example of what you mean by economic and social rights. Access to clean drinking water, access to adequate housing, uh, protection for the handicapped, uh, all these things are... Uh, even the fact that as a normal, average, even poor citizen, when you enter a police station, you should be treated with respect. Mm. Uh, you, your integrity should be, uh, you know, all these things, all these aspects that affect the people in their daily lives. Uh, uh, protection of the rights of workers. We have some workers now that are being tried in front of military courts for exercising their very normal right uh, to demonstrate and to uh, go on a strike. Uh, all these things, uh, they touch people's lives more, and I think by focusing on them maybe is a kind of shift of strategy uh, that we need right now. We need to bring all these issues closer to the people, to, to, to the things that, people, that affect the people in their daily lives, and I think that might have a, a very good positive outcome in terms of the cultural shift uh, that uh, Mohammed was talking about. Mohammed, do you see any improvement in these areas, in people's daily lives, in the very basic, like access to clean water, basic respect? I think definitely that is the first step or the major step that the government or whether, or whether it's under President Sisi or any future government should take. Infrastructure, health, education are key, you know, problems that Egyptians on a daily basis continue to face. We've had many social media pages, for example, in the past year uh, revealing the really bad uh, quality of certain health providers across the country. And so starting with health and education is the primary um, objective. However, at the moment, this does not appear to have occurred, and security and stability and the economy have taken the forefront of discussions um, in the political sphere. Timothy, I know you spend a lot of time in Egypt, most of your time there. Is there a sense of optimism on the streets that things are going to get better? No. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, realistically, people's quality of life uh, in standard of living is uh, under a lot of strain right now. Um, it's, I mean, before the concerns about political rights or anything like that, it's just the the fact that inflation is in double digits. Uh, the currency was just devalued very dramatically um, in March, and looks like it's about to be devalued again, based on the comments of the central bank from uh, the other day. Uh, it's. There, there's a lot of economic challenges in Egypt. The tourism industry is uh, is in a very difficult situation uh, following a number of high-profile uh, incidents. Um, so, no, for, for the most part, people find that the cost of living is rising, salaries aren't keeping up, jobs aren't really available, and the government is aware of this and struggling to find a way to uh, to alleviate some of that pressure, um, but it hasn't been very successful as of yet. Um, and that's really, I think, the main concern on the average working person's mind uh, when, it, when it comes to Egypt, really before all these other questions that we're discussing. Uh, Mohammed, just briefly, last word to you. The young uh, people, they're generally the most optimistic in a society. What's their hope for the future? I think the young people um, are hoping for a future that actually, you know, a government that actually represents them in the future, a parliament that represents them, that their voices are actually heard at the moment. Those in parliament, those in power are all from the older generation from the generation of the Mubarak and former regimes. However, the youth so far have not really been represented. Their um, visions and dreams have not been uh, reached. And unfortunately, this has meant that the youth are largely taking matters into their own hands. So for now, their future is in grassroots initiatives and in going to the streets and actually okay. making the change they want to see. Okay, very interesting indeed. There we are going to have to leave our discussion for today. But thank you all very much for joining us, Ahmed Badawi, Timothy Kaldas, and Mohammed Khairat. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story.
You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, bye for now. Thank you.